I'm back in the hospital. It tested positively with focus groups. They said they preferred midlife crisis when I looked tired and filmed from the hospital. So I engineered uh, a week on call uh, just for the clicks. Um, this is my longest ever video. And normally when I make a really long video, I feel like I've failed, like I've not been able to be concise. But in, on this occasion, I really wish it could have been even longer because this was an absolutely amazing discussion I had with a hero of mine and a hero to many people, I think, um, Professor David Nutt. Trust me, if you find it even a tenth as enjoyable to watch as I did to make, then I'm sure you'll really enjoy it. You'll find it a very thought-provoking and mind-expanding conversation, uh, particularly if you, if you do have an interest in the mind or um, neuroscience or psychedelic um, therapy or the potential therapeutic benefits we might derive from other drugs like cannabis or MDMA, and we discuss all of these things. Professor Nutt is a uh, psychiatrist and a neuropsychopharmacologist. He founded the Psychopharmacology Unit at Bristol University. He's the Edmund J. Safra Professor of Neuropsychopharmacology and Director of the Neuropsychopharmacology Unit at Imperial College. He's the founder of a charity called Drug Science, which I would highly recommend. They provide unbiased and independent information about drugs, and I've certainly found it a very valuable resource. He formally headed up clinical science at the NIH in the alcohol um, division, which I think is in Beth Bethesda, don't quote me on that. Um, he's the president of the European Brain Council, and I'm sure he's president or ex-president of many um, things, but I particularly like the sound of that one. I mean, you know, how cool is that? Who are you? Oh, I'm just president of the Brain Council. However, Professor Nutt is probably better known than most academics because in 2009, he was famously sacked by the UK government for essentially doing his job. They hired him to provide scientific advice. He did that, they didn't like it, and um, they tried to attack him, and he eventually departed with his head held high. In 2008, he was appointed as chairman of the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, and he published an article which compared the risks of horse riding to taking ecstasy. And uh, horse riding was about one in 350 exposures, one serious adverse event in every 350 exposures, compared to that of taking MDMA, which was one in every 10,000 or thereabouts. He made a kind of tongue-in-cheek comparison of horse riding to a fictional drug that he called equacy, um, which was obviously um, humorous, but I thought was a genius way of reframing the risks of activities we consider acceptable risks. And obviously, you know, I'm not saying uh, any of these activities don't have risks, but reframing things that we accept as society, like horse riding, compared to things that are regarded as taboo. As you might imagine, the kind of people that um, are into horse riding and the kind of people with very conservative views have fairly large overlaps of their Venn diagrams, so he certainly ruffled a few horse hairs. He then said that illicit drugs should be classified according to the actual evidence of the harms that they cause. And presented an analysis of nine uh, parameters of harm, which include dependence, physical harm, and social harm, sort of wider uh, harm of the drugs. And unfortunately, we didn't get time to talk about this, which is a shame because it's such an important uh, piece of work that's led on to many similar pieces of work that he's been involved in in other countries as well. And in this ranking, alcohol and tobacco came out more harmful than things like LSD, cannabis, or ecstasy. And Obviously, the government didn't like that at all. Alcohol actually came out fifth overall, behind only heroin, cocaine, barbiturates, and methadone, if memory serves. And this was deemed unacceptable. Um, and of course, you know, the government receives enormous amounts of money from lobbying groups in tobacco and drinks industries. The government publicly criticized him, which was quite unprecedented for, for a scientist like this. Um, and then in the press, it gained a lot of traction. This was known as the, the nut case. And when he was eventually um, fired, it was known as the, the nut sack. This is a cartoon from the time, from the week. It's actually on the front cover of uh, my own signed copy of his autobiography. Yeah, you know, so it won a lot of media attention. We kick off the interview with this episode and from about 15, 20 minutes more general chat, which has some really eye-opening stuff about, um, you, you know, the actual science of drugs which I'm sure a lot of you came for. So without further ado, here is my uh, interview with Professor David Nutt, filmed out in the beautiful West Country. 
Welcome to a very special video for me. I'm extremely honored and privileged to be in the home of Professor David Nutt, who's someone I've admired for, for many years and whose work I followed, but not only um, for your academic work, which we'll, we'll talk about today, but also your role as a, as a vocal defender of, of science in, in the public eye. You know, in my small capacity uh, of uh, trying to communicate science to the public, I've inspired by um, all the work you've done and I'm extremely grateful and it's wonderful to, to meet you today. I would like to start with um, 2009, not to rehash all the details again because you're probably sick of going over that, but I, I wonder if you had some thoughts considering the last 18 months that we've gone through and this unprecedented global pandemic about whether you feel anything's changed with regard to politicians and, and scientists. Well, obviously, I've been reflecting on it a lot. Mm. And um, you won't be surprised to know that I haven't been asked in to help sort out the problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, which is unfortunate, because I could probably have done a better job than what's gone on so far. Yeah, I, it's uh, quite fascinating, isn't it? You see, you, you can see the tensions between the scientists and the politicians. And the scientists, I thought it was the whole, it was excruciatingly painful to watch you know, the whole series of daily press conferences with scientists trying to tell the truth, but knowing they couldn't overstep the mark, knowing they couldn't really say what they thought because they, they would be shafted by the government. I, I, and it was that kind of unbelievable tension which in the end broke me. I mean, I just couldn't play the game anymore. I just started telling, telling journalists what actually the truth was rather than what the government wanted me to say. Mm. So yeah, I think, I, think, I think things have probably got worse. I think- Really? It, well, the, the, the whole COVID, um, sorry, let me just reframe it. The, I mean, I was surprised about two things about COVID. The first is that there was no, I had never seen any description as to what the strategy actually was and what, what the measures would be and what the criteria would, you know, would have to be passed in order to make decisions. I never saw any kind of scientific map. And that was the first thing. The second thing is, despite my efforts, despite writing in March last year, 2020, early 2020, that the big problem with COVID won't, in the long term, will be psychological, not physical. We don't have a sage to deal with the mental health problems. Mm. You know, we, we don't seem to have any policy at all. I can't get the Royal College of Psychiatrists to say anything. So I think it's another example of how the, you know mental health is always seen as some kind of some sort of trivial afterthought. And despite everyone knowing it was going to be the big problem in the long term. Yeah. I think for, for me, I was, a, I was a new doctor when the whole episode sort of um, unfolded and, I, and I, I watched it. And it, it was a bit of a slap in the face because it was a sort of realization that um, government might purport to work with scientists or listen to what they say. But, but actually, if it doesn't serve the narrative that they're, they're seeking, it, it, it can be a challenging experience. And yeah, it's, it's disappointing to hear that you think nothing's really improved. I think it's got worse. I mean, I think, I think the other thing is that the 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 way I mean, my sacking was just a disagreement about the, you know how to interpret data or actually how to deal with data. We don't, we knew what the data was. It was just a question of whether the government would actually do the right thing with the data. But what COVID has told us is that the government don't really care about doctors and mm -hmm. nurses, and yeah. you know the, the the pretense at nurturing the the frontline people is just oh, it's just the, it was just disgusting the way that you know you, you would and I've got. People I've trained who have now have great breakdowns. You know, I knew yeah. two junior doctors who were not working. They were people I trained. They, one of them, uh, you know, did a PhD with me because he just couldn't believe that the, the, the organization that he was working for, that the, the cause he was, you know, championing, could be let down so blatantly by the government. Yeah, no, very disappointing. Well, sticking on the the UK before we sort of move on to the science of, of drugs, which I'd like to be the, the, the sort of main part of the interview, but talking about the UK in general and, and drug legislation specifically, what things do you think we've got right in this country? What things do you think we don't do as well as some of our um, comparable countries? Well, the first one's very easy to answer. <laughs> oh dear. Very little. Oh dear. Have we really got anything? How, how about the sort of medicinal marijuana, for example? That that's been a change in legislation in the last few years. Yes, but in the last three years, there have been three prescriptions on the NHS. Yeah, we have a, an audit. We've published an audit on, on ten children with severe treatment of refractory epilepsy. Mm. We're publishing another audit of another ten. 
they've all had dramatic responses to yeah. medical cannabis. The average number of seizures per week has reduced by 50 times. My gosh. 50 yeah. fold. Some of them are seizure free, mm. having been having thousands of seizures a month. And yet none of them can get this medicine on the NHS. And why is that? Because the doctors who are looking after them, the GPs are not allowed to prescribe, even yeah. though they, the, the GPs see it being beneficial and, and would like to prescribe. The, the block comes with the pediatric neurologists who mm -hmm. say there's no evidence, even though these children have failed. Some of them have failed on eight other anti-epileptic drugs, and there are masses better on medical cannabis. But the pediatric neurologists say, well, that's not proof. Mm. To my mind, as a doctor, if someone gets better, you know, that's good enough, especially if, they, if they've got a t an illness which will kill them, which is what childhood epilepsy if will do. they failed everything else, absolutely, it's, yeah. So that's the first thing. They say there's no real evidence, you know, because you haven't done a controlled trial. You know, you can, how can you do a controlled trial in, in children? Where the, some of them, there's only two cases in the country. I mean, what kind of control would that be? That's the first thing. And the second thing is, even when doctors, the odd doctor decides that they agree, you know, this, they're convinced, yes, this child is so much better on medical cannabis, I want to write the prescription, then the um, clinical commissioning groups refuse to pay. Mm. And they do that in the face of this, of data. Where So there's one example just published recently, one of our, 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 our sort of case examples in our cannabis um, initiative, a young woman, Lucy Johnston, was in intensive care for large chunks of 2019 with severe Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. She, she dislocated a jaw, she couldn't swallow, she was had intravenous feeding, subclavian right. feeding. She had six uh, episodes of sepsis in intensive care in a year, costing the NHS hundreds of thousands of pounds. Eventually she staggers off in a wheelchair with her mother to Amsterdam, gets on medical cannabis. A year later, she's gone to university. She walks with one stick. She saved Cambridgeshire Healthcare Trust hundreds of thousands of pounds. Mm. Her consultant wants to prescribe, but the trust won't prescribe. And I just I just find that failure to join up the dots. Yeah. And that, if any health service should join up the dots, it's the NHS, because mm. it's not as if you're competing with different um, insurers of that. It's, it's, it's a one budget. We've said she's saved hundreds of thousands of pounds and also has got a much better quarter. We should, you know, why she can't we pay a small amount of that hundred thousand to you know to allow her to save her parents paying what they are paying currently, which is about nine hundred pounds a month, just to keep her function. Mm. It just seems wrong to me. Yeah, I mean it's multifactorial, I'm sure. But what uh, you mentioned, trusts not being willing to. So if we say money is maybe a, a short-sighted reason, people can't see the the small expense now for a, a bigger saving. Um, are there any other factors? holding that kind of thing back, societal or cultural factors holding back the acceptance? Yeah, I'm just back to, I'm, I'm writing an essay. I think the BMJ have accepted it. I, I, I'm having to sort of deal with some of the referees' comments, but I'm writing an essay called Why Won't Doctors Prescribe Medical Cannabis? Yeah. Uh, and I think there are a number of factors. And one is that we've spent 50 years denying it has any value. Mm -hmm. And actually worse, saying it's a dangerous drug. That's why it's you know, it's a schedule one drug, you know, it must be harmful, it must be addictive, it must cause schizophrenia. So we've been telling people that cannabis is bad. Doctors have been part of this because, you know, that's what doctors do, educate about harms. Doctors have been sucked in to this belief system that medical cannabis is dangerous. And, you know, I had the, <laughs> the previous president of the British Pain Society saying, you know, our prediction is that 25% of people on medical cannabis will go psychotic. Yeah. Now, actually, even then, we knew from the Canadian database of about 500,000 people, that very few go psychotic. But the myth has been perpetuated to, to dissuade people from using recreational cannabis. It's, and that's got in the way of people being rational about uh, medical cannabis. So that's the first thing that doctors have been saying it's bad and they, they really can't change their mindset. The other reason I think is kind of more interesting, and this is why I I've written this essay, I think it disturbs the doctor-patient relationship. And I think a lot of doctors don't like patients coming to them with solutions, mm -hmm. which I find bizarre. When, when, if patients came to me with a solution, you know, and, and occasionally they did, you know, yeah. I, I would say, right, let's try it. But a lot of doctors are paternalistic, and they say, you mm -hmm. know, it can't, the patient cannot know better than me, 
And, and almost if the patient thinks they know better, I'm going to prove them wrong because I'm not going to comply. Yeah. So I think there's a sort of resistance in the, in the, in the sort of heart and soul of medicine, which I find rather, rather sad and disappointing. Well, you, you've preempted a question I had on, on page three here, but I'm, I'll, I'll ask it now because it's kind of related. And you know, I, I'm not at all in, involved in this field. And, you know, cardiology, I, I don't tend to see um, a lot of these patients. But, you know, a research interest of where I work is a major cardiac arrest center is, is post, post-traumatic, post-traumatic experiences mm-hmm. following cardiac arrest and similar kinds of experiences. And I just wonder what... A, a sort of jobbing doctor like me, I'm not an academic in, in this field at all. What can we do? A, a lot of the people watching this video are, are likely to be interested or, or involved in the medical field. What kinds of things could, could the, the average medic do? Well, yeah, one thing you, you could do is um, follow Drug Science, a charity I set up, which is now running this big initiative. This, it's, it's, kind of, it's like an open audit mm-hmm. of medical cannabis, which we have organised so that people who need medical cannabis can get it at, at cost price. We've got five cannabis producers making it available in the UK at essentially at, at cost price. So so we've now got 1,500 uh, patients in that initiative and we're mm-hmm. beginning to collect data, not just on outcomes, but also on things like side effects, reassuring data. So you can you could follow that. If you have patients that would benefit from medical cannabis, it's essentially it's quite easy now to to get prescriptions if you meet the criteria through 2021. One of the few benefits of, of COVID has been that, you know, maybe people switching to telemedicine. So yeah. before, if you know, if you're down in the, you know, hours of silly, it was quite difficult to get up to London or Bristol to see mm-hmm. an expert. Now you can do it online. And this, and there, and of course, prescription can be sent to you. So it's actually, we've, it's um, pretty straightforward now to be registered and to be engaged. Uh, if you've got a patient or if you think a patient would benefit that's what i do patients are like medical cannabis i can't prescribe but i can say to them at least you can get it at a at a reasonable price through 2021 uh, but the other thing you can do and this is what we we've, drug science has been putting a lot of effort into is educating uh, junior well, medical students and junior doctors so we set we've got a whole a rather nice set of uh, of slide sets for educating the next generation about all these interesting innovations, yeah. including medical cannabis. So you can go on our website, you can mm-hmm. see lectures, you can download slides, so you can become educated. And if you want to learn, essentially there are free courses training you about medical cannabis, which you, you can just have access to. Yes, I mean, I'd strongly endorse um, drug science. It's been a, a source of a lot of interest, uh, information for me over the last few years. And if people aren't aware, uh, Professor Nutt has a um, podcast uh, with drug science that's really fantastic, it aimed at the general audience and, and extremely educational. And one of the topics that you, you discuss uh, reasonably frequently on the podcast is um, the challenges of doing research. Mm. And I've set up a clinical trial and I've been involved in many others, uh, but uh, the ones that were using interventions were either using sort of completely harmless mm. devices to do, you know, don't don't have any kind of effect at all. I mean, that's uh, unfortunate sometimes when it's the purpose of the research. <laughs> but um, uh, but then other other times, just drugs that can be found in any ward um, shelf. Mm. And I found the red tape that I had to go through almost too much to bear, and it almost made me want to quit. And these are for legal, mm. everyday drugs. So I just wonder if you could talk us through the logistics of running a trial on something like psilocybin or LSD. Mm. Well, so it. <laughs> the first thing, the logistics are that you've got to make sure you've got enough budget to last you for five years, because it will take two to three years to go through all the red tape, and uh, and it's bewildering and frustrating, and it's because we have a completely irrational fear of these drugs. So, what I find most absurd, so magic mushrooms and, and the psilocybin from magic mushrooms, is a is a. It's a powerful drug, but it's also, we know it's a very safe drug. Millions of people have been using it every year with very little evidence of harm. But because it's got into Schedule 1, and it's a Class A drug, and the Misuse of Drugs Act, I have to have, had to have a special safe put into one of my rooms, bolted to the floor. Got to have a camera to make sure I'm not sneaking in there and taking a sniff. <laughs> and and I say to the home office, you know, this this is all a bit over the top. Why can't I just put it alongside the the heroin 
that we have in the pharmacy here because we've got a pharmacy at Hammersmith Hospital. You know, it's a big pharmacy. Like, yeah. well, no, you know, this is a Schedule One drug and heroin is a Schedule Two drug, and people might, you know, want to get Schedule One drugs. And I say, truth is, if anyone breaks into a pharmacy, the first thing they're going to take is the fentanyl, yeah. and the second thing they take is the heroin. They're not going to take the side of side. But because we have created this bureaucracy, mm. we can't escape from it. And so, you, you know, you have to comply. So you've got to get a license. It can take a year. You've got to get, you know, you're safe and bolted down and all that. And you've got to find someone to supply the drug. One of the most bizarre things we have to deal with now is this. In order to cut down on supposed risk of diversion of these illegal drugs, the countries are now only allowed to, to issue import and export licenses for eight weeks. Okay. So, because the, the WHO and the UN want to sort of minimise the trans, um, you know, transfer of these drugs across the world, so you get to this wonderful situation. So you you order it to be made, and eventually that you find a company in the world that can make it. One company can make it because it's an illegal drug. After they have to get their own license, so they get their licenses, they slot it into their timescale, they make it, and they say we want to send it back. You say great. You say well, you get an export license, so they get an export license, and as soon as they got, we get the export license number, then we apply for an import license. By the time we've got the import license, their exports right. run out. Yeah. And you're in this cycle of stupidity, mm. <laughs> all to protect the world against something that is really virtually harmless. Yeah, that's a, an interesting segue onto something I learned from you actually when you uh, when I attended one of your talks many years ago about the historical aspects mm -hmm. of um, sort of psychedelic research. Let's assume. I'm completely naive to, to work. I mean, it's not a big assumption. Let's but let's uh, assume I'm looking through the scientific literature in the 1950s and early 60s, mm -hmm. and there's a, a reasonable body of, of evidence suggesting real promise mm -hmm. from substances like L LSD in multiple different mm -hmm. applications. And then something happens, and there's 50 years with with no research mm -hmm. that's done. So what 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 explains that? Well, my view is it was the it was the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. uh, as you said. In the 1950s, LSD, uh, and to a lesser extent, psilocybin, it wasn't until 1958 that, that people worked out. Actually, Hoffman, the guy that discovered LSD, was the guy that worked out that psilocybin was like the baby brother of LSD. Yeah. They both worked on serotonin. And in fact, in 1959, Sando made psilocybin a medicine. You could actually, in some plant countries, prescribe it. Massive amount of research. A thousand clinical papers. Four, oh, wow, as much as that. 40,000 wow. 40, patients studied. Why was it so massively studied because the US government funded over 130 grants. It was a revolution because remember in the 1950s, we hadn't discovered antipsychotics. Mm. We didn't have antidepressants. We had nothing apart from barbiturates and ECT. And, and psychedelics were seen as a complete revolution, not just in terms of treating mental disorders, but also in understanding the mind and also beginning to get sort of models of mental disorders. And everything was wonderful. Uh, until, well, until the Vietnam War, people started protesting the Vietnam War. And what happened was that that, that protest got intertwined with uh, the LSD movement, particularly people like Timothy Leary, who began to champion the use of LSD to change society. And uh, and that was, a, that was actually a threat. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't much of a threat. But the reality is when you're confronted with any threat, uh, uh, the temptation is by most Western governments to try to ban it, mm. and they could. They were attacking people using cannabis. They were attacking black people for using heroin as a way of distracting attention from the Vietnam War, and also finding some groups of people for the uh, the voters to hate, so that they would vote for for Nixon. And then LSD. What we can? What can we do about that? Well, we just ban that as well. So you know, yeah. it's the usual thing. You know, if you're a, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. So so LSD got banned because it was just kind of got sucked into this this anti-war movement and the and then the Nixon war on drugs. But of course, it's been banned for fifty years, and since since then, research has almost disappeared. This is the worst censorship of research of research in the history of the world. There's never been anything that has taken out tools like psychedelics which could revolutionize psychiatric medicine for 50 years I mean, you know, you know, people say well what about the um the bush you know ban on on, on fetal research you say well, well yeah okay but that was just america in fact mm. it actually served our purpose quite well because the top americans came to britain because they could carry on that research whereas every 
pretty much every country in the world signed up to the, the ban on psychedelics. And it's gone on for 50 years. And what's worse, even if you could get money, the American government stopped funding mm. and they were the biggest funders. But there were the odd charities it would fund. But be, you know, because they were Schedule One illegal drugs, the, drug, the DEA in America this, you know, and the FDA, they just they did their very best to make sure you couldn't use them anyway. So you, the regulations just made it virtually impossible. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just, I think at the back of it, they, there was a feeling that if you kind of, if you suffocated research for long enough, the drugs would disappear. Yeah. It's kind of completely bizarre, but, but that's what they were thinking. And, and they, you know, they were wrong. The drugs didn't, it, it didn't disappear, but research did. Do, do you think in that case, it, it was a shame it sort of got involved with a recreational capacity that, that led to, to, to that, that it's sort of been taken out. As, yeah. it's, it's a casualty, a sort of um, the, the medicinal use is a, is a casualty of, of, the, of the recreational use and, and the attempt to revolt against that. Yes. At, at one level, medical use is... A, but the fact is, it didn't have to be banned. Mm. I mean... They didn't ban morphine as got much more problematic recreational use. It kills many, many more people. But it wasn't banned as a medicine. Yeah. But psychedelics were. Mm. Uh, and cannabis was. And so there may be another angle to it. It may be that it was difficult to commercialize. It oh. may be that there are there is a view that that because psychedelics didn't fit into the the pharmaceutical model that was developing in around about the early 60s that maybe the the, the regulators and maybe the pharma companies were, were quite pleased to see it disappear because it it actually gave them a, a much more open field in which to, to develop antidepressants and antipsychotics so that there may be some of that in it as well so sort of staying on the subject of, of psychedelics um i know there, there are different definitions of mm. what constitutes a psychedelic. How, how do you think about what, what a psychedelic is and what um, sort of fits into that umbrella category? So currently, we, when I talk about psychedelics, I'm talking about drugs which, like psilocybin, LSD, DMT, that work on the serotonin 2A receptor. Mm. Because those produce a relatively reliable and consistent kind of experience, but also one that does have therapeutic value and is quite enduring. Now, there are drugs like ketamine, which also perturb the brain in some way similarly. Glutaminergic. They, they, uh, yeah. yeah. So ketamine, but that's a glutamate antagonist. Mm -hmm. And it does disrupt the brain function during the period of taking it. But it doesn't seem to produce quite the same insights and quite the same enduring uh, benefits. So, for instance, when you're using ketamine clinically, typically you use it maybe twice a week for a few weeks. Right. Whereas you can get equivalent effects from just a single dose of psilocybin. Mm-hmm. And drugs like um, MDMA, which is serotonin mediated, but not 5-HT2A, um, that doesn't, that's not typically classed as a psychedelic. No, I don't think we should call MDMA a psychedelic. And actually, I can now prove that to you, because when we look at the brain imaging of MDMA versus psilocybin, they're almost opposites. Oh, wow. Okay. So psilocybin largely targets the cortex, mm -hmm. which makes sense, because that's where most of the 2A receptors are. Mm -hmm. Particularly those very high-level cortical regions, which actually give humans a very special abilities, like you know, like planning, thinking, remembering, and etc. Whereas the MDMA works on the limbic system, deep inside the brain, and, and it probably works to a different receptor, the 5-HT1A receptor, which is a a receptor that is inhibitory and calms down the limbic system. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that um, you said that the sort of proliferation of 5-HT2A receptors. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm aware that humans are somewhat unusual in terms of expression. Mm. Um, uh, do we know why that is or, or what the purpose of, of, of the abundance of these receptors is? No, we don't. But we have a theory. Okay. So we, have a, we are developing this theory that if you look at you know, the density of these receptors in relation to the evolutionary profile of the brain, it is the most recently evolved parts of the brain mm -hmm. that have the highest density of these receptors. Now, there are people that you know <laughs> that believe that these that that's why the brain has evolved. Why well, we've got a much bigger brain and a, a more complex brain, and 
than, uh, than other primates because these receptors are driving brain evolution. And the use of uh, plant products like magic mushrooms you know, could potentially have sparked off that epi you know a period of of this you know rapid evolution because because the the evolution the evolutionary expansion of the human brain is the most rapid mm. evolutionary phenomenon that certainly has been seen in I think in vertebrates so it is it is remarkable and what we don't know what's driven it and it you know, some people say it's because we're eating meat and some people say it's because we're eating flour and uh, some people say because we're drinking but that's probably not true but but it you know the idea that, that, that these receptors clearly have a very important role in high level the, the very highest level of brain functioning and we know why they do it because they're on the on the neuro on their on neurons which make the human brain work so efficiently the neurons which connect the brain rather than do the primary processing so uh, I think it's probably just the, the fact that when when humans make big decisions, when they're confronted with major challenges, uh, they have to. Humans come up with much better solutions than any other primate, and I think it's it's the brain mass that contributes. But I think the laying down of the of the what you might call the adaptive responses to major stresses mm -hmm. could well involve these receptors because we know they're not tonically active. I mean, just as a bit of a historic fact, I started working on these receptors in 19, 19 when did I work on them? 1983. Wow, oh, okay. Because <laughs> an antagonist was developed. It was called Ritanserin, and it was a pure antagonist of the 2A receptor. And we thought, great, now we'll find out what these receptors do. So we gave it to people, and gave it to me for a couple of weeks, did uh, studies on us, psychological studies, did sleep studies. Mm -hmm. uh, and almost nothing changed, right, right. except m more slow wave sleep. Mm -hmm. You got deeper and uh, more entrained slow wave sleep. And actually, at that time, there was an in interesting sort of, kind of little, um, sort of you know what you might call a blind alley of neuroscience. In at that time, in the early eighties, it was thought that well, it was known. <laughs> it's known more slow wave sleep gives you more growth hormone. In this, we thought it would be a good thing. And the company that made Ritanser, Janssen, wanted to sell it as a sleep promoting agent. And, um, and the regulators said, well, we don't believe in sleep promotion. Because when we look, the paradox is that, that the more slow wave sleep you get, which could well be good for you, that doesn't translate into subjective improved sleep. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So this is, and so, and of course, the other side of that coin is you you give people sleeping pills, which give people subjectively great sleep, mm. but they actually make can make the sleep worse. Yeah. So you've got this paradox that the drugs we license and use all the time, actually, because they give you subjective improvements, probably aren't as good as the drugs we rejected. So the, the regulator said, no, we don't care about sleep quality. We don't more slow wave sleep isn't necessarily a good thing. It could have been a revolution. It could have been, you know, in the long term, slow wave sleep could have actually massive, you know, more of it could benefit humans. But anyway, so they went. And then, you know, 30 years later, I, I take the agonist mm. and I give the agonist to humans and look at their EEGs and boy, they're all over the place. So instead of having the synchronicity of the antagonist, mm. you've got this, um, what we call entropic or chaotic state. Yes. So we're absolutely convinced that those receptors now are, 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 are mediating essentially brainwave, brainwave activity. Uh, and, um, but why, I, so but not tonically active because except possibly um, at night or when you take other drugs. So why are they there? Well, I think possibly because if something important happens, you've got to really respond to it and remember your response and then perpetuate that. And it may be that when you're confronted with something hugely important, when we discover fire or invent the wheel, that kind of light bulb moment, those receptors are involved in laying down the new pathways. That's fascinating. That's really interesting. I want to expand on a couple of things that you said there. One was about the, the sort of cross linkage. Yeah. I'm going to expose my rudimentary neuroscience knowledge from, from distant memories in med school now. But um, uh, my understanding of, of one of the ways psychedelic therapy can work for a lot of, um, on the surface, disparate psychiatric yes. conditions. Um, and the explanation that I've, I've 
un, uh, I've got, and, and correct me if, if I've um, simplified this too much, is it's kind of uh, putting things into disarray temporarily to try and break some of these mm -hmm. restrictions. And, mm -hmm. and I've heard the term psych psycholytic. To my untrained um, sort of mind, it was somewhat reminiscent of ECT that you, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned briefly, mm -hmm. uh, electroconvulsive therapy, mm -hmm. um, which again is a, a, a sort of regarded as a kind of crude way of kind of scrambling things and, and giving a chance to, to reset. Do you think that comparison has any validity at all or do you think they're quite separate entities? Yeah, it's an excellent question and, and I thought a lot about it and the answer is complex so can you bear with me? Sure. So there is no doubt that during a seizure you disrupt ongoing brain activity. Um, and that's why consciousness changes. It's not exactly the same kind of disruption as you get with a psychedelic, because obviously it's different because you're unconscious during the seizure and you're not with a psychedelic. So that may be one important difference because we, we, we are thinking that the psychedelic experience, profound and complex and difficult as it is, because you're still conscious, you can actually remember it and, and actually can use it in subsequent psychotherapy. So that's the first difference. The second difference is the ECT, the effects of ECT usually need a series, a course of ECT to build up. And um, we know why that is. Most people don't, but I can tell you, we, we worked that out 30 years ago. It's because ECT over time gradually recruits different neurotransmitter systems. And the first couple of seizures they recruit dopamine. And that's why when people are so depressed that they won't eat or drink, the first couple of ECTs can, for a few hours after the ECT, liberate them to eat and drink. And that's dopamine. And that's, that's the drive to eat and drink. Then over the next few seizures, four, five, six, the noradrenaline system gets turned on. And we know how that is. It's a different mechanism. Uh, and that gives, gives people drive and energy and they start to do more. And then it, towards the end of the course, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, that's when the serotonin system gets turned on. It's that point, and only at that point, which is three weeks or four weeks, then you begin to deal with all the negative cognitions. Mm. So ECT is powerful, but it does take time. Yeah. Whereas psilocybin is as powerful, but you just need a single dose. Yes. Yeah, so, so I think that's an interesting point because I think perhaps some people have the impression that when we talk about psychedelic therapy. It's uh, people dropping a tab of acid, listening to Pink Floyd every weekend. Mm -hmm. Whereas actually, it could just be one session uh, that's sufficient. Um, yeah, it? it's very important that people understand this is a conceptually totally different approach. So if you look at our first study, we took 20 people with resistant depression. They'd all mm -hmm. failed on at least two antidepressants. Some had failed on more than 10. They'd all failed on CBT. And of those 20, about five are still recovered. Mm -hmm. A single dose, a single trip. And so we're talking six, seven years. Well, yeah. And that's remarkable. What's sad is that the other 15 have relapsed. And, and that tells us something really fundamental about depression. Well, the first thing is it's a really serious disorder. It's a disorder that comes back. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, you're a, you're a cardiologist. You know, you, it would be quite... Remarkable if you could get rid of you know, everyone's uh, atheroma with a single treatment, you know, just overnight. But that's like what we're doing with mm. um, with some depressed people. But the others, it's whatever we're doing is we're suppressing the depression, but it's kind of crawling its way back over time. If, if I remember correctly, though, they they all showed some improvement. Oh yes, yeah, absolutely. Everyone got a bit better. Most people got a lot better, and actually, in a way, that's worse because. To get a lot better for three or four or five or six weeks mm. and then slowly yeah, have the depression. Like, yeah, so I'm kind of thinking more now, it's more like a cancer model that, that depression is a kind of is, is a phenomenon that yeah. locks your brain in and you, you can beat it down. And maybe we have to keep beating it down. So in the second trial, mm. uh, which we've just published recently, we um we gave two doses, yeah. three weeks apart. And we're now collecting the data to see if that second dose prolonged the benefit. Mm -hmm. Talking of recently published trials, you had a, a, a great paper in the New England Journal yes. this, this year, which was psilocybin against escitalopram, yes. which is a normally prescribed uh, SSRI um, antidepressant. And the results 
were actually sort of it, it didn't suggest that uh, a significant benefit what, what do you think happened in that trial or how yes, you interpret those results really important trial um so this was the first time anyone had put a psychedelic head to head with a conventional treatment and um i say there's a few things to say about it the first thing is the trial was not designed to show superiority of either mm -hmm. Because we knew, I mean, escitalopram is probably the best SSRI, yes. yeah. and and we were giving it for six weeks, so we were we were giving it a really good chance to work, and we were giving a lot of psychotherapy with it, so we kind of knew, you know, I mean, it, it was going to work because it always does. So it was a very hard um, comparator. That was the first thing, uh, and the pa we couldn't, well, we didn't have enough money or time to do a you know to do a superiority because we did, I mean, to do thirty patients in each arm. In a study like that, it's actually pretty challenging. I mean, it was that was absolutely challenging. You know, it nearly broke the team, just the effort, especially with COVID coming up. Yeah. We only lost one person, thankfully. But that was the first thing to say. The second thing was, but it was powered. It was powered to test a theory that we we had developed, which is that there is a fundamental difference in the way SSRIs work in the brain compared with how psychedelics work. Yeah. And that we believe, and in fact, I can tell you, I reckon we've shown it now, and that paper is still under review. We can show that the brain after a psychedelic is different mm -hmm. from the brain after an SSRI in a way which fits with the idea that you're more flexible and more able to solve problems and deal with the challenges in life. So that's what the study was powered for. So the this clinical outcomes were were really a secondary, yeah. but so important, obviously, they had to be published. Yeah. Now, what happened was that the primary outcome we chose, we chose two primaries, but the one that people understand is called the, is the depression rating score called the QUIDS, which is a self-rating score. And it had been used in many, many trials in the States. And, and we used it because we just thought it, it's a self-rating, it would be easy. And it didn't discriminate. But all the other studies, all the other, we used another self-rating scale, the Beck, we used Hamilton and the Madras, so standardized clinical rating scales, they all did differentiate. And uh, it's not entirely clear to me why why one did and the other three, three did and the other one didn't. But then when we look at remission rates, even on the quids, remission rates were almost three times as good. Uh, and I think the problem with the quiz is it's it's a, it's not a linear scale really. It's a kind of all or nothing for each of the items, and I mm. I think that might have distorted the results. Uh, but the other thing, fascinating, when you look at I mean, just produced a graph the other day in a, in a paper I'm writing. When you look at this concept of remission across, so the con you know there's a concept of remission that people are basically free of depression. It the difference in proportion remission between. The different scales is phenomenal. So I'm beginning to wonder. You know, I'm not entirely sure how comparable each scale is. Really, it's they seem to, they you know they've definitely got different kinds of you know metric properties. Yeah, I think that's an important point. Maybe for for, for those viewing who are less familiar with, with clinical trials, is the difference between non -in, non inferiority trial and 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 sort of what what a, a head to head comparison means. So so it certainly is not a discouraging result. Um, but uh, yeah. something to, to, to continue. I mean, on. I think to be a one treatment, to be as good as the best available out there and to work after a single dose yeah. uh, and to be effective and to carry on working all the way through the six weeks while the escitalopram sort of slowly... Yeah, I mean, I don't yeah. think people would have believed us if we beat it anyway. I mean, because people would say, well, you know, you're, you know, it's, I mean, you know, antidepressants are pretty good treatments. To, mm. beat, to beat them is hard. Yeah. Um, but to, to have an alternative strategy to treating yeah. depression uh, is actually quite exciting because it, you know, we, you know, we can maybe treat people that won't respond to SSRIs. Now. Yeah, no, very, very uh, exciting stuff. Talking of, um, I think you sort of hinted at it there about work that's yet to be published in terms of showing that the brain is, is changed. Uh, I assume you're referring to sort of um, imaging. Yes, um, yes, yes. And I sometimes joke with my... Uh, psychiatry and, and neuro friends that uh, they make fun of the fact that I'm a uh, the organized studies is far more straightforward um, than the brain mm. uh, and I retort that at least we kind of understand how it works exactly. but yeah, yeah. Um, it's striking that a lot of the ways we actually interrogate each organ are, are kind of similar so uh, either sophisticated ways of measuring the electrical activity mm. or imaging and and my own background is in MRI and nice. um, PET MRI, which I know, I know um, your team have have, yeah. have employed, although the MRI sequences are, are quite different. 
And what are the kinds of things that you see in the brain with regard to psychedelics? Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll tell you it historically, because I think it's, it, the story is quite interesting that way, rather than just go to, straight to the neuroscience. So when, the, the very first imaging study we did was with um, uh, an MRI technique called arterial spin labeling. Yes. And we were, it's a measure of where blood goes, and blood tends to go where me metabolic activity is in the brain. So we, so we did this study, put people in a scanner, uh, gave them psilocybin. They had powerful experiences. You know, they, their ego dissolved. They saw lots of hallucinations, etc. Some of them disappeared into space, and one bowed at the foot of God, and thankfully he came back. And they're all there at the end, and we take them out, and then we do the analysis, thinking the brain's going to be lit up. We're going to have all these visual cortex lit up, and, and, and the motor cortex is their bodies disintegrating, etc. Nothing was turned on, not at all. We just saw a couple of regions of the brain where there's a lot of these 2A receptors switched off. What is this? It doesn't make any sense at all. Have we done the experiment wrong? Have we just reversed the data? No. So we went and replicated it using another MRI technique called BOLD. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and that gave exactly the same results. And we realized we discovered something really fundamental that Timothy Leary was wrong. These drugs don't turn on the brain. They turn off the brain. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what does that mean? Well, what it means in hindsight now is, is when we look at the regions that are really turned off, they're the regions of the brain which control the brain. And that is the reason you have interesting experiences under psychedelics because normally your brain is not letting you do the things that you can do under psychedelics. And what was so wonderful about that discovery was that I started rereading Aldous Huxley mm. and his, dis his description of his first masculine experience was, Wow, he said, my brain has been opened up. Or my mind has been opened up. And and then he and then he made this wonderful logical conclusion. So if mescaline opens up my mind, there must be something closing it. Mm -hmm. What is that? The only thing it can be is my brain. And he said, the brain is an instrument for focusing the mind. And then fast forward 50 years, and we then discover that that's exactly what the brain does. Yeah. The brain controls the mind. And we know that, and we know that from you know, the work of you know, physiologists looking at how we reconstruct a visual image. Mm -hmm. you know, your brain doesn't take a picture of what's out there. Your brain gets some electrical impulses from your retina, and then it constructs in a very efficient way an estimate of what's out there. And then it tests that theory. You know, I think there's a table. Yes, there's a table. Okay. And then, and then it doesn't worry about what's there anymore because it knows the table's there until you move. So the brain becomes an extremely efficient, predictive um, machine. And psychedelics disrupt that mm -hmm. because because that those predictions are made at very high cortical levels, and back connections to the visual cortex are disrupted by psychedelics, and that is exactly why you see these you know these pretty colorful hallucinations like you know the christmas tree lights and that why is what you're what you're actually seeing under a psychedelic is you're seeing the primary processes of your visual cortex you probably haven't seen those since you were a baby wow. so and i find that really thrilling that you can actually you can see how your brain's working mm. at that level so that's the first thing so that these drugs they they take away the top now is the description i use is you know, the brain is like a very, very sophisticated orchestra. Mm -hmm. And that kind of makes sense because actually, I mean, the, the electrical activity of the brain is a bit like music. And it's been controlled by this network called the default mode network. Yes. And there are two hubs, the frontal hub, which is the hub that integrates your planning and your thinking with your memory. The posterior hub, which integrates your, your seeing, your feeling, your proprioception, your touch, etc. And those two work together. And if you switch those off, then the orchestra doesn't have a conductor anymore mm. uh, and the orchestra can do, can do its own thing. And of course, the analogy is with jazz. You know, you, you can also switch off that network with cannabis and that cannabis led to jazz because people decided they could syncopate rather than follow the score. The other great thing about breaking down this control system in the brain, the default mode network, is that that goes wrong in conditions like depression mm -hmm. and addiction and anorexia. It goes wrong in the sense that it, it has the wrong hypotheses and it directs the mind in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And so by turning it off and by disrupting it, we can allow people to escape from 
the repetitive beliefs and thoughts that they've had maybe for decades mm. and then see another way out. So is, is that a common sort of thread running between these conditions, so anxiety disorders, depression, um, uh, this, this f feeling that there is this restriction from the brain over the mind? The disorders we've been talking about, depression, anxiety, OCD, anorexia, addiction, they're all what we call internalizing disorders. Mm -hmm. They're all disorders in which people get locked in to modes of thinking that are disruptive and, 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 and damaging and which they don't want. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, I've worked with addicts for 40 years. And most addicts hate being an addict, mm. but they can't stop thinking about their addiction. They can't stop acting on it. I'll give me one example of a guy, alcoholic, who he was only about 28, and, and we brought him into the research ward and we dried him out. And he'd been drinking since the age of about seven. And uh, and then he was great. We shook hands. He went out, and he was back in two weeks later, being dried out again. I said, "What happened?" He said, "He said I don't know. I just found myself in a bar, and I was drunk. Mm. I have no recollection of going to the bar. I didn't want to go to the bar. I just and that it, habit. That's right. And the habits are subcortical in a way. Mm. So so you have this you have this mode. Your brain gets locked into a mode of doing things you don't want to do. Your brain is is driving your behaviour." And uh, if we can disrupt that at the level of so the cortex, which might then overcome the, um, the, 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 the habits or at the level of the habits themselves, we don't know, it might work there. Then we can, you know, people can be free. And then, you know, it's like wiping the slate clean. A lot of patients often describe it being like, um, they use computer analogies. The depressed patients, they often say, like I defragged my hard drive or I, I reformatted it. Yeah. I can start again without all that baggage, yeah. without my mind doing all the things it I didn't want it to do. Yeah. We challenged some of the misconceptions about what psychedelic therapy mm. looks like. So I, I wanted to explore that a little bit more. If I was a, an observer in a session, mm. a, a psychotherapy, mm. psych, psychedelic psychotherapy session, what, what does it look like? What does it actually mm. entail? Yeah, so it's really critical that people understand it, it, that there are. it's, it's quite structured, it's quite sophisticated. There are three separate phases. Um, obviously, firstly is choosing, you know, making sure the patient is eligible and suitable, doesn't have a risk of psychosis. We mm. always exclude people with that. Uh, it's not on any drugs which could cause, you know, either a problem with the psychedelic or more likely prevent the psychedelic working. Like an SSRI? Or well, SSRIs, but also uh, uh, many antipsychotics block the receptor. Yeah. So mm -hmm. so those are, um, you know, there's no point in sure. having a psychedelic if you can't get an effect. Yeah. So that's the first thing. And then, and then once they're suitable, then they come in for, the day before they get the trip, they have a, a sort of planning session, an educational session. They're, they're prepared. And they're prepared in two ways. They're prepared for what might happen because by and large, depressed people, when they have trips, their trips aren't fun. Mm. By and large, they're actually challenging. They often go to places where they they remember what the trauma was, which led to their depression. And that yeah. can be very, very you know, challenging to them. So, But we explain that, that we're there all the time. There's always We always use two therapists in the room. That might be a bit extravagant, but we do. The, the therapists are there. The therapist can can be spoken to, the therapists don't speak unless they're asked. The therapist might hold hands in that to, 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 just to reassure the person if they're in a bad place. Uh, uh, and then the next day they have the trip and the therapists are there, etc. And then the, the day after we have what's called an integration session. That's when they come and they talk to the therapist about where they went, right. what they saw, okay, interesting. what yeah. insights they had. And this therapist helped them make sense uh, of their, their inner discoveries just mm. to help them put the depression to bed or suppress it and, and think about uh, in, in new ways of living. Yeah, I, I don't, again, know the, the practicalities of it, but I know something that's quite popular are these ayahuasca retreats. Yes, yes. And I don't know if, uh, I always got the impression they were kind of a guided experience, but you, 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 this is quite hands off. You don't, the therapists don't get involved with the actual experience. Is that right? Yes, yeah, so the, the difference, yes. Yeah, so what we do is that the, the person is on the bed, they have usually the one, uh, headphones and they want music they mm -hmm. usually use eye shades and they lie there and they they float to wherever they're going to go and, yeah. and very often they are somewhere else in the universe um we've discovered from working with uh not depressed people you know when you with the brain it, <laughs> when we started doing the brain imaging studies we thought well wouldn't it be interesting to to get people when we're scanning them to do a task mm. you know we could see whether they're 
whether they could count back serial sevens, count back from a hundred. Yeah. But when you when someone's having a trip and you know and and yeah, and you say, well, right, well now it's uh, thirty minutes into your trip, I want you to count back from seven from a <laughs> hundred. One guy said, "Oh fuck off! I'm just talking to God." <laughs> you know, I mean, and 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 it really is not. You know, the point is, your people are in a in a in a place where they've almost never been before, and. And they don't, you know, actually the trivialness of trying to ask you to do some kind of executive work. What the hell? You know, when you are, when you are somewhere better. Yeah. The, the, and this is, a huge, this is a huge problem because quite a lot of the literature is contaminated by people forcing people to do tasks when they don't yeah. want to. So I've become quite interested in the, the ayahuasca retreat, shamanistic involvement uh, or oversight idea for a couple of reasons. The first is it's obviously ayahuasca is a DMT preparation. Uh, and with, when you drink it, the effects last a long time. So you, you, know, you have a, very often an overnight or a, a long session, you know, maybe a bit longer than side aside, but not necessarily so. But more, more interestingly is the question of doing it as a group. And I've, I was always concerned about anxiety as being a negative predictive factor. When we, in our first trial, it, the people that had anxiety during the trips, they tended not to do so well. Mm -hmm. So I always used to say, well, I'm not sure I want to use it in people with PTSD. You know, let's use MDMA for PTSD because that dampens down the anxiety. If, if psychedelics make it worse, then it could have bad trips. But I've now spoken with quite a lot of veterans and veterans have been going to ayahuasca ceremonies and getting benefit. But they've been going as groups. And I'm thinking that's interesting, isn't it? So veterans, you know, they, they get traumatized as a platoon. You know, they, they might, you know, have three or four of them damaged as a result of a, a bomb and, and, and some dead. And, and they carry the memories of the bomb and the deaths with them uh, as a group. And maybe healing as a group is more powerful. So I'm, I'm interested in that as, a, mm. as an efficient way forward and as a way particularly for people who, who've got. And you see that, the, you know, the, the, the ayahuasca retreats for veterans, you know, all veterans have been traumatized in that kind of the same way. They've mm. all been blown up or shot at. Yeah. So they have a they have a bonding, which is all depressed people are rather different. You you mentioned I, I unfortunately my camera cut out. Uh, you you just mentioned that the sort of ritualistic aspects yes, yes. for some people can be yes, uh, useful alternative to the to the more medical clinical one. Yes, there's another real advantage of the, of the kind of the ayahuasca approach, the shamanistic uh, session approach. Is that it, there's a huge ritual. There's a there's not just a ritual there, but there's a history. You know, there's yeah. thousands of years of, yeah. of ritual, and for some people, I mean, that's a powerful thing yeah, to, to be engaged with. We, we've talked about a lot of the potential benefits and um, promise that uh, these agents offer. Uh, on the flip side of that, does the hype that seems to surround mm. psychedelics at the moment? Uh, they're mm. certainly gaining a lot of interest, mm. particularly with. People who maybe not, don't have a scientific background, mm -hmm. very influential mm -hmm. celebrities, podcasters talking about them as almost a panacea. Um, does that concern you or do you feel happy that there is an interest? Both. <laughs> I mean, I'm, it's great that the, the, the field is kind of come back into what you might call, you know, it's come back into the light, it's come out from under the shadows. I mean, people have been doing underground therapy and suffering. You know, there, are, there are people who have gone to prison for doing underground yep. therapy, particularly in Switzerland. I think it's great that it's being out and we're discussing it and, and trying to come get the truth about it. Uh, will it be a panacea? I doubt it, actually. I, th I think it'll be really helpful for some people. Um, part of the hype has been driven by what people see commercial opportunities. Um, there's been a lot of money has flown into psychedelic research from the uh, sort of overspill from the cannabis industry. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of sort of cash floating around. Is it, would you say that profit driven or a genuine sort of desire to fund research? Well, I think the companies are profit driven. Although I have to say that there's a lot of philanthropy in psychedelic medicine. Yeah, well, I guess government grants are hard to come by. Yeah, so look, I mean, let's face it. So we've been working in this field for 15 years. Mm -hmm. We've produced many of the top papers both in terms of imaging, in terms of, in terms of clinical research, you know, we're absolutely the world leaders, and we've got one small grant mm. from the government. Mm. Everything else we've done has been on philanthropists. Yeah, and in America, there are a lot of Silicon Valley, a lot of the richest people in America, have used psychedelics and have benefited from psychedelics, even if they're not telling you openly. Mm. 
I mean, Steve Jobs, Steve of course, Jobs, yeah. famously yeah, said, you, yeah. know, you know, you make the biggest company in the world. There's one of his machines here. And what does he do? And, you know, he sees the need to fuse beauty, you know, aesthetics and, um, and sort of functionality and, and, and computing and bring them together. And, you know, and it's, a, you know, that, so you, we know that there are a lot of people who have made huge amounts of money because they've got insights and uh, from psychedelics and they want to put some money back into it. So they, but a lot of them are also now going to, investing in the commercial companies I, you know I, I i hate it if it if if it failed because the commercial side of it didn't work you know it would be horrible if we kind of did so much but then people say well it's just not it's too expensive and we can't afford it and you know and that's kind of you sort of get the impression because it isn't although in the long term it's likely to be very cost effective when you're in the short term, when you're comparing, say, you know, two sessions of psilocybin with all the psychotherapy that goes with it over against, you know, 10 pence a day for a SSRI, you know, I kind of fear that NICE might say, whoa, you know, but it, it's good enough. No, the SSRIs are good enough. Is, is, that a, is that a valid comparison or should they be comparing against some of the more, um, uh, I'm thinking of, say, s um, Infusions. Well, that is also, yes. So like, you get to the other extreme, that's right. So esketamine is expensive. So it, psilocybin is likely to be less expensive than esketamine. That is also true. Mm -hmm. But let's remember that NICE haven't approved esketamine. True, yeah. I mean, it is, it's, there is a, I believe, a stigma against mental health. It permeates so much of medicine. I think it, you know, we know, you know, the, the threshold for accepting new treatments in psychiatry is very, bottom line is, We've known for decades that if anything that costs more than a pound a day for depression won't get licensed. You can go up to three pounds a day for schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And that, the contrast that with obviously what people will pay for cancer treatments yeah, or other, no, you know, there is a, there is a, and they say, well, it's because there's so many people suffering, but you think, well, maybe if we invested a bit more, <laughs> there'd be less people suffering. So it would, it would pay for itself in the long term. I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I suspect it'll, America will take the lead on this, uh, which is unfortunate because we've we've started it, we've yeah. seeded it, but uh, but at least if it's happening somewhere. And, and of course, you've you've um, sent one of your collaborators over there recently. Well, he's been seduced. I mean, look, it's an interesting story. So here, Robin Carhart Harris, you know, he came to me, two thousand and five. He worked on MDMA with me. Then we did the first psychedelic. We thought, you know, we have the you know, here's the best CV in the world in psychedelic research. Yeah, couldn't get a fellowship in Britain. Yeah. Could oh, not, wow, I didn't realise that was the... Um, could not get an MRC fellowship, could not get a welcome fellowship. Mm. People people kind of don't want to believe yeah. that psychedelics are important. Uh, as in the, and, you know, and that's kind of sort of validated by the fact we can get grants to research it. I must have had 12 grants turned down to carry on my research. Yeah. And it's all because they say, well, this is not real yeah. pharmaceutical research. No, it's not. Well, we only, you know, that's the mindset at present is that there's only one way to do mental health research and it's the old way. Yeah, yeah. And I don't, uh, and we get these amazing, people say, well, maybe it's all placebo. And why don't you, <laughs> so I said once, well, why don't you, well, I don't kind of believe it's more than placebo. Why don't you give psychedelics under anesthesia to see if they work then? It's, you think, well, <laughs> what, what other treatment would you ex what, and what does it mean? Is all perceived? What is perceived? Half of what we do in medicine is getting people who want to get better, giving them the encouragement so they can get better. Yeah. If that's what and that's what placebo is. If psychedelics empower the what if you want to call the placebo response, and they get better and they stay better, well, great. Yeah. But let's harness the placebo response if it, if that's what it is. I don't know what it is, but it it shouldn't be denigrating it you should be looking at outcomes and if the outcomes are great who cares whether it's placebo or whether it's a drug or some combination of the two i'm i'm very encouraged uh, by because a, a phrase i've used in many of my videos is exactly that you know there's no shame in trying to harness the placebo effect and and historically in medicine we refer to it as a, as a kind of negative we try to eliminate it from trials uh, for understandable reasons but it has translated to regarding it as a, as a kind of problem rather yes. than something to, to benefit Absolutely. from and you mentioned um, San Francisco and Silicon Valley, so, which is a beautiful segue into my, my final question, um, which is your very elegant study on microdosing, yes. which again is something that's gained a lot of interest 
And many people, particularly of that kind of Silicon Valley mindset of maximizing mm. productivity, mm. swear by microdosing. For those that aren't aware, it's taking a kind of sub, I guess, sub therapeutic, but maybe even sub effect dose, yes. one one to two milligrams, maybe, of... Of, um, of, of psilocybin. Of, of uh, psilocybin, thank you. Man. And about 10, mi 10 micrograms or less of LSD. Just to explain this bit, Prof Nutt was an author on a recent study, which was very interesting, and looked at microdosing and essentially found that um, the group taking microdosing um, improved their psychological parameters, but so did the group that were taking a placebo treatment in fact, there was no statistical difference in the main psychological outcomes between the two groups. And it wasn't a perfect study, for, and it's very challenging to do this for reasons that Prof Nutt's going to go into in a second. Um, but it was very interesting to me that the first real decent attempt to look at microdosing with a control group, because up till now we've just had uncontrolled studies, um, which, as I'm sure you know if you've seen many videos on this channel before, uh, may be informative in some capacity, but they can't tell you whether something works categorically. So the first study that's attempted to do this has actually shown that about at least 90% of the effect um, is a placebo effect, which I found uh, very interesting. The study results were actually fascinating. and I, I wonder if you could tell us about those. Yeah, so this was it's impossible because <laughs> The drug laws in this country, and you think in pretty much every country that comply with the UN conventions, the drug laws say that a single molecule of LSD is illegal. And so here's, a, here's, a, here's, a, here's an interesting tale for you. Four years ago, I got permission, ethical permission, to do a microdosing study at the Hammersmith. And microdosing LSD I wanted to get 10 micrograms twice a week for six weeks. And the ethical said, sure, sure, but you've got to do it in hospital. And we said, what? He said, yeah, you, they have to come in and get their 10 micrograms. And we said, it was a microdose. They said, no, no, you've got to keep them there all day until for at least eight hours because of the half-life of LSD or that is eight hours. And we said, but they won't, nothing will happen. And they said, no. And costing that up, yeah. it was important. We couldn't afford to do it because mm. we were buying rooms in hospitals for expensive hospitals. That have. So we never done that study. And no one has done a proper microdosing study because no one can afford to comply with the regulations, even with it. And it's, uh, it is completely absurd. But anyway, so how could we get around that? Well, what we did is this guy, um, uh, Bala Seghetti, he, he, was a, he was a physicist who, who's been working on sort of kind of statistical problems for a while. And he came and he said, look, I have a plan. We can, we can do microdosing. We can get people who are going to microdose. We can work out a way where they can random, they can separate their active from um, pretend empty capsules. And we will then randomize. We'll send around, we can work out a randomization code. So they'll just do it at home uh, and we'll randomize. Brilliant. Mm. And, uh, and so we did it. And, but the clever twist to it was there were, they, the people had to guess what they were taking mm. uh, and, and whether they were taking placebo or taking a microdose. And then we had, so we had the de real data and we had the guess data. And what was really, the, the, so I suppose the core finding was that if you thought you were taking a microdose, whether you were right or wrong, it worked. Mm -hmm. You felt better. And if you thought you were taking placebo, whether it was placebo or a microdose, it didn't work. So the expectation effect was, over, you know, that was the primary effect. And it was a reasonably big effect. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so microdosing is basically works if you are microdosing and you think, you know, if you believe in the microdose, it is, again, it's like, is it a placebo effect? Yeah, maybe it is, maybe the, maybe it's, maybe there is some kind of, um, Potentially, we found a little suggestion and one or two variables that the, the microdose might even be more than a, a placebo effect. But mostly if you get out of it when you want to get out of it. But then that is kind of, you know, like most of medicine, most people want to get better. So, and if these drugs facilitate you getting better, then, you know, good for that. Well, Professor David Nutt, thank you so much for, for generously giving me your time. Um, I, I, I don't know if there's any particular take home message you, you want to um, to try to get out there. As I've, I've mentioned earlier, I'd recommend anyone to listen to your podcast, look at the drug science website and, and um, 
uh, you have a huge body of mm -hmm. um, work uh, writing. Or yeah. One of one of your books are right here, and many behind yeah. you. If you want to learn more, it's in my, it's all in my autobiography. There yeah. you go. So yeah, feel, feel free. And you also we haven't talked about you know being attacked by the anti vids yet, but we'll do that another time. I mean, there's loads we could have got into. I, I, I I'm also really fascinated by your work of combined harms of of drugs and, and we could have talked for, for the whole hour on, on just alcohol alone we could have done but yeah. um alas another time another time thank well, you it's again. Been really nice to talk to you thank you and you you've researched it extraordinarily well well done oh thanks thanks that's very kind of you great did you have a copy of this